All right, good morning. And turn, if you will, in your Bibles to Romans chapter 7. <clears throat> Romans chapter 7. Verses 7 through 25. And then we'll open in a word of prayer. What shall we say then? Is the law sin? God forbid. Nay, I had not known sin, but by the law. For I had not known lust, except the law had said, Thou shalt not covet. But sin, taking occasion by the commandment, wrought in me all manner of concupiscence. For without the law, sin was dead. For I was alive without the law once, but when the commandment came, sin revived and I died. And the commandment, which was ordained to life, I found to be unto death. For sin, taking occasion by the commandment, deceived me, and by it slew me. Wherefore the law is holy, and the commandment holy, and just, and good. Was then that which is good made death unto me? God forbid. But sin, that it might appear sin, working death in me by that which is good, that sin by the commandment might become exceeding sinful. For we know that the law is spiritual, but I am carnal, sold under sin. For that which I do, I allow not. For what I would, that do I not. But what I hate, that do I. If that I do that which I would not, I can set unto the law that it is good. Now then, it is no more that I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. For I know that in me, that is in my flesh, dwelleth no good thing. For the will is present with me, but how to perform that which is good, I find not. For the good that I would, I do not, but the evil which I would not, that I do. Now if I do that I would not, it is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. I find that a law, that when I would do good, evil is present with me. For I delight in the law of God after the inward man. But I see another law in my members, warring against the law of my mind, and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin which is in my members. That's... uh, Cross-reference back in chapter 6, Neither yield ye your members as instruments of, of unrighteousness and of sin. Verse 24, o, wretched man, o wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then, with the mind, I myself serve the law of God, but with the flesh, the law of sin. Alright, let's open a word of prayer. Dear God, we thank you so much for your many blessings. I thank you for Jesus Christ. And everything that he's done for us, I thank you for coming to earth and manifesting uh, yourself in the flesh. I thank you, dear God, for being born a son. I thank you, dear God, for being obedient unto death. I thank you for being humble. Lord, I thank you for learning obedience through suffering. I thank you for paying uh, for our sins on the cross with your own blood, uh, with your own body on the tree, as the Bible says. I thank you so much for all those things that we can never repay, Lord, but we do have a debt to you to live godly in Christ Jesus, and I pray that you help us to do that, help us to walk in newness of life, Uh, help us to uh, serve God in newness newness of spirit and not in the oldness of the letter. Be with us, Lord. Uh, Show us the things that you have for us in your book this morning. Help us not to get caught up in in doting about questions and strifes of words, whereof cometh envy, strife evil surmisings, but dear God, that you, you'd show us what you say so that we can follow and obey. God, that we could do what you would have us to do, that we could put it to action, that we could practice it, that we could live it out, that it wouldn't be dead to us, Lord, um, like the dead language of Koine Greek. And I pray, dear God, that you'd make these words alive to us. I know that they are alive, Lord. And they have been in our life to us, and I thank you, dear God, so much for that. And I pray that you do it again with us this morning, that you open these words up to us, that you sink down into the ears of all the people that are listening on the tape, Lord, that you protect them and comfort them and love them and show them your words, show them your love, show them your truth, and show them how they ought to walk. 
And I pray that you do the same for us, Lord, who are present here. And I pray for Daniel and Karen as they're uh, absent this morning traveling, that you be with them, that you protect them, that you give them safe travels, um, that you stay in their minds and in their hearts, and that you'd help them to uh, remember the things that they've learned from your words and take, take those things with them uh, as they walk and as they visit family. And I pray for all those things that you know. Be with us this morning. Protect us. Keep us safe. It's in Jesus Christ's name we pray. Uh, amen. All right, so just by way of review, uh, we've been studying in Romans 6, uh, 7, and 7, and, and 8 is kind of the culmination um, with respect to us. Uh, and then it shifts over to Israel in chapter 9. Um, with respect to this extremely practical discussion of how we're supposed to be and indeed how we are after we get saved. And that's stated very plainly in summary at the beginning of chapter 6, uh, starting in verse 3, Know ye not that so many of us, were, as were baptized into Jesus Christ, were baptized into his death? So there's this spirit baptism, not water baptism, as we studied. Um, verse 4, Therefore we are buried with him by baptism into death, Okay, so we're baptized into his death, uh, that like his, and we're buried with him. So we're baptized into his burial, and we're also baptized into his resurrection, that like his Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. For if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall be also in the likeness of our resur- of his resurrection, knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth, We should not serve sin. So notice, every time God makes a doctrinal statement as to your position in Christ, he follows it with a practical instruction of how you're supposed to live your life. He says you're baptized into Christ. He says you're buried with him by baptism and death. And he says you're raised to walk in newness of life. You're raised, uh, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead, um, from the dead, by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. So Christ rose again from the dead, big deal, what's that got to do with me? Well, I'm telling you what it's got to do with you. Because Jesus Christ rose again from the dead, that means that you, Christian, should walk in newness of life. Because you have the hope of one day being in the likeness of his resurrection, verse 5. So, he didn't just leave you, uh, comfortless. He didn't leave you without hope. He gave you a position and a doctrine and a belief to follow and something to hope for that will, that will be physical and made real ultimately. And we'll read about that when we get to chapter 8 uh, with the adoption, the redemption of our bodies. But in the meantime, we need to walk in newness of life. Now, what does that mean? That means reckon yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin. That means neither yield your members as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin. That means sin shall not have dominion over you, for you are not under the law, but under grace. That means in chapter 7, that you are dead to the law uh, by the by the body of Christ, verse 4, that you should be married to another, even to him who is raised from the dead, that we should bring forth fruit unto God. That means that there's three uh, ways in which God gave you, three tools, three things to help you to understand and to put into practice that you can have the po- you can have power over the sin in your life. Number one, don't make the mistake like a lot of people make uh, in believing that sin is done with. Like the holiness people say that uh, once you get saved, you're crucified with Christ, so therefore all your sin is crucified, therefore you don't have no more sin. And therefore you're perfect and just nothing but the new nature from then on. And so when one of these alleged people with the new nature uh, gets caught fornicating after getting saved in a holiness church, the answer is, well, they were never saved to begin with. They didn't truly believe or something to that effect. See, but that ain't the case. Uh, By grace are you saved through faith and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Therefore, we conclude that a man is justified by faith without the deeds of the law. Uh, that's Romans chapter 3. 
uh, down in verse 28. Therefore we conclude that a man is justified by faith without the deeds of the law. See? And that's with respect not just to the fact that you don't have to work to be saved, you only have to believe, but that with the emphasis on the works of the law, that you don't have to have the law of Moses in order to be saved. Because in the next verse after that, he says, um, Is he the God of the Jews only? Is he not also of the Gentiles? Yes, of the Gentiles also. See? And uh, the same Lord over all is rich unto all that call upon him, Romans chapter 10. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God and of salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. So the emphasis here in chapter 6 and chapter 7 is don't live after the flesh. Don't walk after the flesh. Uh, because if you do, the wages of that sin in, in verse 23 of chapter 6 is death. That's the physical death of a Christian who walks after the flesh. If you want to die ten years more than you were supposed to, then just go ahead and fornicate. Go ahead and watch porn. Go ahead and, uh, uh, what else? Uh, tell dirty jokes. Go ahead and drink yourself silly every Friday night. Go ahead and not show up for church when you know that God wants you to be there. Go ahead and not pick up your Bible. Go ahead and occupy your thoughts with every random thing that comes across the airways on television. Go ahead and fill yourself with those things instead of with the precious, holy, perfect, lovely, and true words of the Lord Jesus Christ. Wholesome words, as it says in 1 Timothy 6. See? You are what you eat, as they say. And uh, you can either yield yourselves servants to sin unto death, uh, chapter 6, verse 16, or uh, make yourselves um, have your fruit unto holiness and the end everlasting life. Now you do have your fruit unto holiness, and the fruit is there for the taking, but in order to grab it, you have to walk in newness of life. Now I promise you, Christian, that if you believed on Jesus Christ, if you put your faith in Him, if you said, Jesus Christ, I believe that you rose again from the dead, that my sins are paid for, please save me. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Then you're saved, that's it. Um, when the Philippian jailer asked Paul and Barnabas, uh, what must I do to be saved? He said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. He didn't say be baptized. He didn't say do good works. He didn't say anything else. He said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. However, now that you are saved, God gives you the power to walk in newness of life. He gives you whatever it is that you need, the strength, the courage, the knowledge from the words of this book to reckon yourself dead of the sin, to know that you have power over sin, that you're not the servant of sin anymore, that you can still submit to it, but only of your own free will, and that you're not married to the law anymore, but you're free from the law, and free to, that you should be married to another. Uh, Romans 7, 4, Wherefore, my brethren... Ye also are become dead to the law by the body of Christ, that you should be married to another. Now who's that? Even to him who is raised from the dead, who's that? The Lord Jesus Christ. That we should bring forth fruit unto God. Which, by the way, the Lord Jesus Christ is what makes all these things possible. Without him being God manifest in the flesh, if he is anything short of what he claimed to be in his book, then he does not have the power to give you eternal life in heaven, victory over sin, Hope of eternal life. Hope of your body being redeemed. Hope, and uh, which maketh not ashamed. Uh, love of God. He can love you all he wants to, but he don't have the power to do anything about it, to help you, to secure you, to comfort you. He doesn't have that power if he's not God. And if Jesus Christ didn't rise again from the dead. And so, I assure you, just like this book does, Jesus Christ rose again from the dead, and... And in doing that, he showed and demonstrated and proved that he has all the power needed for you to do everything that he wants to do. I just can't do it. Some of those folks in church are just better than me. I can do all things through Christ which strengthens me, he said in Philippians 4. Now get it. I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me. He said in another place, without me, he can do nothing. 
But with Christ, I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me. Now you get in there reading in that passage and don't misapply the verse and say, well, I can be a superhero and win the Super Bowl. Uh, I can be Tom Brady. I can be President of the United States. I can be uh, Bill Gates and be a millionaire. I can be a super genius. I can be what... No, no. If God wanted you to be those things, then you could. But God wants you to be who He wants you to be. And that means, Christian, get up in the morning and pray for God to help you to put down your flesh and to be made conformable unto His death and to reckon yourself to be dead indeed unto sin. And today, even though you failed yesterday, confess it when you go to bed at night or at any point during the day to Jesus Christ and say, God, please cleanse me from all unrighteousness. Help me to put this behind me and to walk in newness of life. Help me to walk um, uh, in the words of, of, uh, of verse 4. That like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. Help me to serve God with my spirit in the gospel of his Son, Romans 1. Help me to uh, serve God in the newness of spirit and not in the oldness of the letter in uh, chapter 7, verse 6. See? Now that's something that every Christian has to, has to do. Uh, whether you do it or not, you have a duty to do it. You have a burden to do it. You have a debt to God to do it. And not to pay for your sin, but to live right. But to walk in newness of life. But to show, uh, excuse me, the Spirit of God in your life. Reckon yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin. Sin shall I have dominion over you. You're not no longer married to the law, but now you're free to marry another. That is to say, Jesus Christ. Alright, now look at verse 7. What shall we say then? Is the law sin? Because uh, if you'll remember, we just got through reading in 4, 5, 6, how that, um, for verse 5, for when we were in the flesh, the motions of sin, which were by the law, did work in our members to bring forth fruit unto death. But now we are delivered from the law. So, through the law, we died. We understood that we had sin. And so the next question of the rebellious understanding, not lack of understanding heart, is in verse 7, what shall we say then? Is the law sin? The law must be sin then, because when I found out about the law, now I know I'm going to hell. Whereas I was doing just fine before that. See? If you read back, remember back in in chapter 6, for when we, uh, verse 20, for when you were the servants of sin, you were free from righteousness. And Paul refers to a time when he was innocent. Uh, Look down in verse... Nine, for I was alive without the law once, but when the sin, when the commandment came, sin revived and I died. See, sin was there the whole time, but because sin is not imputed where there is no law, uh, chapter 4, verse 15, because the law worketh wrath, because where no law is, there is no transgression, and chapter 5, verse 13, for until the law, sin was in the world, but sin is not imputed where there is no law. And that's how you know uh, babies go to heaven uh, when they're aborted. Amen. I can't say the same for the mother if she's not saved. Um, but if she's saved, she, she can uh, be redeemed from that. Amen. But that not the baby. The baby is, doesn't have a sin imputed to him because without the law, sin is dead. And there is no law in that child. Now, there's a point at which uh, the commandment came, verse 9. And that happens in every man and woman and child on this earth. Uh, well, what are you talking about? I didn't know anything about the Bible law. Most, yeah, but you had some kind of law in your heart, uh, Romans chapter 2. You had some kind of standard. You had some kind of understanding that was a function of your natural growth that nobody had to tell you that you knew was wrong and were ashamed of when you did wrong. Every one of you, and myself included, Every man, uh, every woman, every child goes through that. And Paul refers to that time in verse 9. For I was was alive without the law once. That's when he was a child before he understood that there's a difference between right and wrong. But when the commandment came, sin revived and I died. And the commandment which was ordained to life I found to be unto death. For sin, taking 
occasion by the commandment, deceived me, and by it slew me. Now, there's a whole lot of preaching in that verse. Sin is deceptive. It looks bright and shiny, but when you start getting close to it, it'll bite you. And it doesn't leave you as good as as before you, you went into it. Amen? It always leaves you less. It always steals from you. It always promises something that it doesn't give. Or promises that what you want from it will last. And it won't. And it doesn't. It's deception. Evil men, seducers, show acts worse and worse. Deceiving and being deceived. What is that? Sin. Sin. Just sin. Sin. Same thing that everybody has. Same problem that everybody has. But the problem which is dealt with by Jesus Christ in this way of paying for the penalty of sin so that we don't ever have to worry about going to hell again. We don't ever have to worry about God having wrath on us or his wrath abiding on us like it does on everybody else in the world, on the Gentiles. Uh, as we read in Romans chapter 1 and Colossians chapter 3 and Ephesians chapter 4 and almost every letter that Paul writes, he refers to it. See, and so in these verses, verses 7 through 12, we come to understand what is stated plainly in verse 7, that the purpose of the law is so that you can be aware of sin. Look at verse 7. I had not known sin but by the law, for I had not known lust, except the law had said, Thou shalt not covet. See, it doesn't say that I had not sinned if it hadn't been for the law. You were sinning before you knew about the law one way or the other anyways. But sin wasn't imputed to you because you didn't know it. See? So when a baby at two years old starts crying and being rebellious and stinky and, and sinful, that doesn't mean that sin's imputed to him because he still doesn't know. See? Just because you know, that don't mean he knows or she but we're not talking about them right now. We're talking about you who do know. What have you done about your sin? Have you nailed to the, have you have you given it to Christ? Have you asked Jesus Christ to save you and let him nail it to the cross, put it into an open shame, Colossians chapter two? Have you been forgiven? Have you been to Jesus for the cleansing power, as the song goes? Uh have you uh, had your body uh, crucified with Christ? Uh, Galatians 2.20 Are you baptized into his death? Now you are baptized into his death with the spirit baptism, 6.3 um, So then the question, Christian, is are you walking in newness of life? Are you reckoning your body uh, to be dead indeed unto sin? Are you yielding your members as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin? Or... Uh, yielding yourselves unto God as those that are alive from the dead and your members as instruments of righteousness unto God. Chapter 6, verse 13. Where do you stand with these things? See, this isn't just information. This is not a history class where you sit there and uh, yawn your way through date after date in historical event. Yeah, 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 Benedict Arnold. Yeah, 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 George Washington. Yeah, 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 um, Winston Churchill. Yeah, 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 uh, Archduke Ferdinand. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, the, uh, the, what? Get it? Yeah, so all these boring stories. That's not what we're talking about here. We're talking about something that happened personally to you when you received the Lord Jesus Christ as a payment for your sin. And what that means with respect to how you're meant to live your life day by day, hour by hour, minute by minute. And that is, Fighting this battle between the old man and the new man. And say, well, okay, I got that, but I don't know what you're talking about, about uh, uh, yielding your members to God and uh, members as instruments of righteousness unto God and fruit unto holiness. I have no idea what you're talking about because I got saved. I felt the same way the day after as I did the day before. Well, that's because you have to grow up. Amen. Uh, Unless a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. But when your spirit is born again, uh, John chapter 3, and it's your spirit that's born again, we'll talk about more about that next week. You think it's just born as a 33-year-old male immediately? 
No, it's born as a child. And that child has to learn and grow. The Bible talks in, in Colossians 3 about the... Your, um, well, I'll turn there. Keep your fingers here and turn to Colossians chapter 3. Colossians chapter 3. And we'll look at this really quickly. You have to grow up. Uh, and look down in verse... Well, I'll start in verse 1. If ye then be risen with Christ, which ye are, right? You're baptized into his death. And, uh, ri- and uh, in chapter 6. And plan together in the likeness of his death. We shall be also in the likeness of his resurrection. And like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. And so he says, if ye then be risen with Christ, which we are, um... Ephesians chapter 2, keep your finger here, in Ephesians chapter 2 he says, excuse me, he says, even when we were dead in sins, verse 5, hath quickened us together with Christ, by grace you are saved, and hath raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. So, if you then be risen with Christ, is that a question? Are you risen with Christ? Yes, is the answer. And same thing back in uh, in chapter 2, verse 12 of Colossians. Start at verse 11. In whom also ye are circumcised with a circumcision made without hands, and putting off the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ. Okay, you're separated from your body of sin, which we'll talk about that in a minute, back in Romans 7. Buried with him in baptism, that's what we read in Romans 6, wherein also ye are risen with him through the faith of the operation of God who hath raised him from the dead. See, he's risen, but one of the benefits that you get from the circumcision of Christ and putting off of the body of sins of the flesh, verse 11, is that your spirit is risen with him, verse 12, and hath raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ. In verse 13, and you being dead in your sins and the uncircumcision of your flesh, see, hath he quickened together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses. So then we get to chapter 3, if you then be risen with Christ, it's not a question, it's saying, because you are risen with Christ, therefore you should seek those things which are above where Christ sitteth in the right hand of God. Why? Because that's where your spirit is right now. You're in Christ, right? Christ is in you and you're in Him. So you're spiritually, your spirit is wherever He is. Where is He? At the right hand of God, amen? Or in the words of Ephesians 2, um, seated together in heavenly places. Raise us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places, in Christ Jesus. Amen. That's something God just showed me right in this moment. Sit together in heavenly places. Sit together in heavenly places, in Christ Jesus. So we sit together with each other, but we sit together with Christ, who is seated at the right hand of, of, of the Father. Amen. All right, verse 2 of Colossians 3. Set your affection on things above, not on things of the earth. For ye are dead, and your life is hid with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, see, that's your body, you're dead, and your life is hid with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, shall appear, then shall ye also appear with him in glory. Mortify therefore your members which are upon the earth. Well, what are those? Fornication. That's the first thing. That's the first thing on the list. Uncleanness, inordinate affection, evil concupiscence, and covetousness, which is idolatry. Having therefore food and raiment, let us therewith be content. First Timothy 6. Be content with such things as ye have. Hebrews 13. For which things sake the wrath of God cometh on the children of disobedience. See, these things in verse 5 are the reason why God's wrath abideth on the children of disobedience. In the which ye also walked some time when ye lived in them. But now, and here's the thing, here's the condition, here's where you are in Christ Jesus, 
Here's where you are in Romans 7. Here's where Paul was when he described the struggle between these two things, the things of verse 5 and the things of verses 8 through 17. Here's where you are, but now ye also put off all these. Anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, filthy communication out of your mouth. Lie not one to another, seeing that ye have put off the old man with his deeds. And I put on the new man, which was renewed in knowledge after the image of him that created him. Now, here's this whole list of things of how you're supposed to be and how you're supposed to act. Uh, meekness, long-suffering, verse 12. Um, forbearing one another, forgiving one another. Verse 13, if any man have a quarrel against any, even as Christ forgave you, so also do ye. Charity, verse 14, which is the bond of perfectness. Peace, let the peace of God rule in your hearts, in your hearts now, to the which also you are called in one body, and be ye thankful. Let the word of Christ, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom. See, this is one of the things. Reading your Bible, and memorizing your Bible, and letting the words of the Lord Jesus Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom is one of the things that you're supposed to do, which is included in, in, uh, in mortifying therefore your members which are upon the earth, and putting on the new man, verse 10. See? Uh, My little children, of whom I travail in birth again, until Christ be formed in you, he said in Galatians 4. And what he meant when he said that was, okay, you're, Christ- you're little children, you're Christians, you're saved, You're born again by the Spirit of God, but you need to grow up. Christ needs to be formed in you. And in that light, read verse 10, and have put on the new man, which is renewed in knowledge after the image of him that created him. It's renewed in knowledge. Does that mean you just automatically know anything, everything, the the minute you got saved? Let me tell you what you know the minute you got saved. Same thing you knew the minute before you got saved. Except now, hopefully, you know that you're saved. Amen? But let me ask any one of you who's, who's heard any one of these messages, or has been in this book for any amount of time, or who has ever opened this book and read any verse in it, do you know everything? Amen. All right, now turn to 2 Corinthians uh, 3. 2 Corinthians 3. I'm going to start in verse 16. Nevertheless, when it, shall be, when it shall turn to the Lord, the veil shall be taken away. Now the Lord is that Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. But we all, with open face, beholding as in a glass, that's the Word of God, um, The 2 Corinthians uh, 13, the glory of the Lord, are changed into the same image from glory to glory, even as by the Spirit of the Lord. See, the same image. What image? The image of God. No, we're changed into that image from glory to glory. But see, it's not something that happens in a moment in a twinkling of an eye. Although it does. Um, in 1 Corinthians 15 and 1 Thessalonians 4, when we're caught up to meet the Lord together in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. But up until that time, there's a gradual process of you being renewed in knowledge after the image of Him that created Him, and changing into the same image from glory to glory. Look at verse, uh, chapter 4, verse 1. Therefore, seeing we have this ministry, as we have received mercy, we faint not. But I've renounced the hidden things of dishonesty. I'll just preach on that for a while. Renounced the hidden things of dishonesty. Not walking in craftiness, nor handling the word of God deceitfully, but by manifestation of the truth, commending ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. But if our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost in whom the God of this world, that Satan, hath blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. 
So what's the image of God? Jesus Christ. Man was made in God's image, right? Uh, uh, Genesis chapter 1, verse uh, 27. In the image of God made he them. <clears throat> and that's another, and uh, that's another study that we'll get to, but I'll just refer to it. And if you look in Romans chapter 5, uh, Adam may have been made in the image of God, but everybody after Adam was, was made in the image of Adam. Um, um, Genesis chapter 5, I believe it's verse 3. I'll just look there real quick. And this is a bigger study uh, that we will get to in the coming weeks. Um, but chapter 5, just but just by way of introduction and reference, uh, let's see, this is the book of the generations of Adam, and the day that God created man, and the likeness of God made he him. See, that's, and then back in, in 127, he said, uh, so God created man in his own image, and the image of God created he him, male and female created he them. Verse 2, chapter 5, verse 2, male and female created he them, and blessed them, and called their name Adam in the day when they were created. And Adam lived in 130 years and begat a son in his own likeness after his image and called his name Seth. Now whose image was Seth made in? In the image of Adam, see? And that's why um, in 1 Corinthians 15, as in Adam, all die, so also in Christ shall all be made alive. It's the image of Adam. Now, who is the image of God? We just read in 2 Corinthians uh, 4. The image of God is Jesus Christ. Um, verse 4, 2 Corinthians 4, 4. For we preach not ourselves, but Jesus Christ the Lord, and ourselves your servants for Jesus' sake. See? So, all you jokers who think that uh, you're, the pastor is a master, and you're a servant, and you're supposed to obey him, uh, even when he does wickedly. Um, here, Paul is an apostle, and he calls himself a servant for Jesus' sake. But not just the servant of Jesus Christ, which he is, in almost every letter that he writes, he says. But here he says, in ourselves, your servants, for Jesus' sake. He says, I'm here to minister to you. I'm here to help you. I'm here to show you. I'm not here to lord it over you like the Gentiles do, as it talks about in Peter. This is a side point, but look at verse 6. For God, who commanded the light to shine out of darkness, has shined in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. For we have this treasure in earthen vessels, that the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. See? So there's two things there that we get from the Lord Jesus Christ that we got when we got His image back. And that is uh, light and knowledge which shine in our hearts. Uh, verse 6, and power, uh, verse 7, which is of God and not of us. And there's many things um, in those verses that I'm not touching on right now because I'm trying to stay on the topic, hard as it may be to believe, of Romans 7, which is, to, which is about the struggle between the flesh and the spirit. Uh, Galatians uh, 5 says, Now the flesh lusteth against the spirit, and the spirit against the flesh, and these are contrary the one to the other, so that you cannot do the things that you would. See? And what is that, if not a summary explanation of chapters, of Romans chapter 7, verses 13 through 25? He says, For we know that the law is spiritual, but I am carnal, sold under sin. For that which I do, I allow not. For what I would, that do I not. But what I hate, that do I. See? My spirit hates the sin that my body does. And I want to do good things, but I can't. I can't find how to. Look at verse 18. For I know that in me, that is in my flesh, dwelleth no good thing. 
For the will is present with me, but how to perform that which is good I find not. I want to do right, I just don't know how. Here's how. Reckon yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin. Neither yield you your members as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin, but alive unto God as those that are alive from the dead. Walk in newness of life. Remember that sin shall not have dominion over you. Remember that you're not married to the law anymore, but you are free to marry another. For the purpose, verse 4, that we should bring forth fruit unto God. See? It's not just so that you can be saved, although it is that. More than that, it's so that you can have some fruit and some rewards at the judgment seat of Christ so that God can bless you and show all the universe His kindness towards you and what He did for you, not only in uh, saving your miserable, uh, dirty, filthy, sinful soul from hell, H-E-L-L, but in giving you the power to walk in newness of life. But it's not so easy, as Paul uh, explains here. Uh, for that which, in verse 15, for that which I do, I allow not. For what I would, that do I not. But what I hate, that do I. If then I do that which I would not, I consider the law that it is good. See? It's not, when I, when I mess up in sin, I don't say that the law is bad. I just show that the law is good, uh, by my own sin. Now then it is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. Why? Because, uh, because your flesh and your body is where sin dwells, verse 18, and again in verse 20, now if I do that I would not, as no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. Your sin is in your body, that's where it dwells, in your flesh, in your members, that's where your sin dwells, not in your soul, which God has separated and made perfect, Colossians chapter 2, by the operation of of spiritual circumstances, the operation made without hands. Uh, Colossians chapter 2, see? And so when you sin, it's your body that sins, not your soul. And that's different than it was in the Old Testament, where they didn't have this operation of spiritual circumcision, Colossians 2. They only had the operation of physical circumcision, and were therefore still married to their soul, and their soul, therefore, is still married to the sin of their flesh. So in the Old Testament, when uh, you walked around and you committed a sin, you touched something that you shouldn't touch, that infected your soul. And we'll look more about that in coming weeks in Body, Soul, Spirit. I keep meaning to just stop the sequence of Romans 6, 7, 8 and just go through Body, Soul, Spirit. I'm trying to do it a little bit at a time. It's a big subject. Um... Bear with me. Amen? Mm-hmm. Uh, Alright, look at that in verse 21. I find then a law that when I would do good, evil is present with me. I want to do good, but I can't figure out how. But I see another law in my member. For I delight in the law of God after the inward man. I want to do right. I delight in doing right. I just can't find out how because I naturally want to do wrong all the time. I naturally don't want to read my Bible when I get up in the morning. I naturally don't want to memorize the Bible, and I certainly naturally don't want to recite a verse of Scripture to all my friends and family. Who would not be comfortable with that? <laughs> Amen. <clears throat> For I delight in the all... Well, uh, I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. But look at verse 23. But I see another law in my members warring against the law of my mind and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin, which is in my members. Now, there's a whole group of people who say, uh, the holiness crowd, that say, well, see, Paul is here describing uh, the condition of a man before he gets saved. But then once he gets saved, um, so verse 24, he's at the point of like utter wretchedness and calls out to God to get saved. And then in verse 25, um, he's now saved and doesn't have to deal with the sin anymore. But see, notice that all of these words are present tense. He said, if I do, that's present, I find then, present, when I would do good, present, 
I, for I delight, not I delighted, present, but I see, present, present tense, present tense, present tense. Paul wrote this passage in the book of Romans as a saved man. Uh, verse 1, Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, separated of the gospel, not only a saved man, but a separated servant of the Lord Jesus Christ, who is engaged in the preaching of the Lord Jesus Christ, and the gospel of Christ, verse 16, not ashamed of it. And even after that, he still, day by day, has to fight this battle against the flesh. Which he uh, surmises in verse 24, O wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? Question. Answer. I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. How am I going to be delivered from my flesh? Even after everything that Jesus Christ did for me, I still mess up in my thoughts, in my heart, and in my body every day of my life. I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then, with the mind, I myself serve the law of God. See, myself, I myself, because that's where you are now. That's who you are. So then with the mind, I myself serve the law of God, but with the flesh, the law of sin. So your body, uh, Pastor Ham calls the flesh, calls the body, can't do right. <laughs> you and your body can't get right. Can't get right. That's your name. Can't do right. Your flesh is incapable of doing right. But in Christ, you have the power to have victory over your flesh by reckoning it to be dead indeed unto sin. Verse chapter 6. By understanding that sin shall not have dominion over you, for you're not under the law, but under grace. By recognizing, Ephesians chapter 1, turn there, that the same power that Jesus Christ exercised when he rose again from the dead is the power that is in you to have victory over the sin in your life. Uh, Ephesians chapter 1, look at verse 19. And by the way, no Greek needed. And what is he, uh, verse, uh, certain verse 15, Wherefore I also, after I heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus, and love unto all the saints, cease not to give thanks for you, making mention of you in my prayers. So there's two things here. Paul is praying for you. And these words are given by the inspiration of God. They're inspired by God. And therefore, the Holy Spirit is praying for you these same words. God wants these things for you. That the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give unto you the spirit of wisdom and revelation and the knowledge of Him. He wants you to have a spirit of wisdom and the spirit of revelation and the knowledge of Him. The eyes of your understanding being enlightened that ye may know what is the hope of his calling, which uh, part of the hope of his calling is the redemption of our body, uh, the adoption in Romans chapter 8, which we'll get to in the next chapter, uh, when we're caught up together to meet the Lord in the air, and what the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints. Now get this, uh, verse 19, And what is the exceeding greatness of his power to us who believe according to the working of his mighty power? See? See the emphasis on the greatness of his power and the working of his power and the might of his power and the fact that it's mighty and exampled and raising a guy from the dead, verse 20, which he wrought in Christ. The same power of verse 19 which is to us who believe, which he wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead and set him at his own right hand in the heavenly places, which he also did to us in chapter 2, verse 6. Far above all principality and power and might and dominion and every name that is named, not only in this world but also in that which is to come, and hath put all things under his feet and gave him to be the head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him that filleth all in all. Power. Well, I just don't know if I can do it. Shut up. You can do it. I can do it. I don't want to hear that you can't do it one more time. Because Jesus said, I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me. Every time you say that you can't do it, you call Jesus Christ a liar. You call, you call the words of this book false. You say that you don't have the power um, that Jesus Christ 
uh, demonstrated in, in raising, being raised from the dead. Now these words are true or they're not. And that is why also, notice that power, notice in chapter 1 we read about power, 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 wonder working power. We read about that power. Now read that into Romans 6 verse 4. Therefore we are buried with him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. Because just like Jesus Christ was resurrected physically, so will we also be resurrected physically. And that power is there. But in the meantime, that power also exists and is in us and worketh in us, Ephesians 1 says, that we should walk in newness of life. Romans 6, 4. Why don't you do it? It's because you choose not to. It's because you choose not to. That's the doctrine of the two natures. Uh, on the one hand, you should take comfort that you're not the only one. Amen? That, uh, turn to James chapter 5. James chapter 5. And look down at verse uh, 17. Elias was a man subject to like passions as we are, and he prayed earnestly that it might not rain, and it rained not on the earth by the space of three years and six months. And he prayed again, and the heaven gave rain, and the earth brought forth her fruit. See? What are you saying? I'm saying Elias, that is to say Elijah, was just like us in the things that we're tempted about. And he did these great things for God. He prayed uh, that it wouldn't rain, it didn't rain. He prayed again and it rained. See? He wasn't any different from us. In fact, he was worse because he wasn't born again by the Spirit of God. He was a man of like passion such as we are. So take comfort that it's not just you. Alright, turn to, uh, turn over to Hebrews chapter 4 and look down in verse 14. Seeing then that we have a great high priest, who's that? The Lord Jesus Christ. That is passed into the heavens, Jesus the Son of God, let us hold fast our profession. Well, how are we going to do that? It's so hard. For we have not an high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities but was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. See? Elijah was a man just of like passions, just like we are, and he served God greatly and went up uh, in a chariot. But here, we're talking about the Lord Jesus. Well, that was the Lord, and he wasn't sin. Well, look at this in verse 15. Uh, Hebrews 4.15 For we have not an high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities. See? Bible says after he, was ten, after he was in the wilderness 40 days and 40 nights before he was tempted of the devil, it says he afterwards and hungered. Yeah, I guess so. Amen? See, you think about, well, well it's God. He can do this and he's knowledge and Yes, Jesus Christ had power to raise again from the dead. Yes, Jesus Christ had power uh, not to sin. But he could have sinned, see? And he was tempted to sin, according to this verse, but was in all points tempted like as we are, in the same way that we are, yet without sin. And because he had victory over it, because he paid for our sin and dealt with it, and because he rose again from the dead, sinless, importantly, look at verse 16, let us therefore come boldly into the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. See? Because Jesus Christ paved the way for us in dealing with death and sin and rose again from the dead, so we can come boldly into the throne of grace and find grace to help in time of need. Amen? Amen. So take comfort that it's not just you. First Corinthians 10 says, uh, There hath no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. But that's not the end of it. But God is faithful, who will not suffer you to be tempted above that ye are able, 
but will with the temptation provide the way of escape that you may be able to bear it. See? There's not one obstacle in your life or anybody else's life that is so great that you can't get past it by the power of the blood of Christ and by the power of Jesus Christ living in you and by the power of being made conformable unto his death and the power of his resurrection, which uh, ultimately is to be caught up together to meet the Lord in the air, and in the moment and twinkling of an eye to be changed, and this corruption shall put on incorruption. But in the meantime, that same power exists every day between now and then, every hour, every minute, it's there for you to engage, to, to, to lay hold on, to have victory over the sin in your life. To make right decisions. To think about the things the right way. To read your Bible, the King James Bible, instead of them comic books that all the churches read. The ESV and the NIV. The Nutty Idiots Version, as Dr. Ruffin calls it. Follow after the things in this book. Amen? Amen. Stop... Uh, Stop giving in to your flesh. But take comfort, because there's victory in Jesus Christ. And the answer, um, ultimately, in chapter 8, is the summary of how we're supposed to walk and what we're going to get eventually. Um, but now he's, he laid it out for you in chapter 6 and 7. Reckon yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin. Uh, sin shall not have dominion over you. You're not married to the law, but now free to marry another. Why? Because of Jesus Christ. You become dead to the law by the body of Christ, that you should be married to another, even to him who is raised from the dead, that we should bring forth fruit unto God. And you now have the opportunity to have fruit unto holiness in the end of everlasting life. Uh, chapter 6, verse 22, you have your fruit unto holiness in the end of everlasting life. You have the opportunity to serve God in newness of spirit and not in the oneness of letter, in, of the letter. As Paul said in, uh, in, in Romans 1, whom I serve with my spirit in the gospel of his son. You have the opportunity and the power, uh, to do those things and the instruction that that's what you're supposed to do. And the, the words of this book to give you all the things that you need. Uh, that you think you'll be missing if you serve God. Alright, uh, two more verses. Now Paul, Paul doesn't hesitate to make himself an example of this. Uh, he says in 1 Corinthians 11.1, 1, uh, Follow me, even as I also follow Christ. <clears throat> but see, he says, follow me as I follow Christ. Paul never one time asked you to follow him in anything where he wasn't following Christ. And you have the words of this book to discern that. And there is instruction after instruction after instruction. Romans 16, uh, 1 Timothy 6, Philippians 3, and others. 1 Corinthians, uh, or 2 Corinthians 10, um, about ministers of Satan. Um, there is instruction in this book not to follow those who are not following Christ, but are enemies of the cross of Christ. Philippians 3. Uh, look at verse 17. Brethren, be followers together of me, and mark them which walk, so as ye have us for an example. So, follow us, and mark them um, who walk according to our example, but mark them which walk not according to our example. Verse 18. For many walk, of whom I have told you often, and now tell you even weeping, that they are the enemies of the cross of Christ whose end is destruction, whose God is their belly, and whose glory is in their shame. Well, who's that? It's people who don't follow Paul's example. Uh, in this chapter, the example is uh, counting your accomplishments and your lineage as dung. He says in verse 2, Beware of dogs, beware of evil workers. That's a direct cross-reference to verse uh, 17 and 18 and 19. He's saying, don't follow men whose conversation um, is not in heaven. See, look at verse 19. 
uh, whose glory is in their shame, who mind earthly things. That's a characteristic of men who aren't following the Lord Jesus Christ. They're not following the Lord. You're not following the Lord Jesus Christ if you're following a paycheck. And I'm not saying you don't got to work, and I'm not saying God can't bless you with a good paycheck. What I'm talking about is the attitude of your heart and the primary factors of the decisions that you make. Supposing the gain is godliness, First Timothy 6. Who mind earthly things? You should fix your heart, you should fix your mind, set your affection on things above, the Bible says in Colossians 3, not on things in the earth. Verse 20, for our conversation is in heaven, from whence also we look for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall change our vile body. See? So instead of worshiping your body, by the way, all you athletes out there, and, and you know, there's nothing wrong with, you know, exercise, uh, except to the extent that there is, in uh, 1 Timothy 4, body exercise profiteth little. But you need to fix your mind on the Lord Jesus Christ, changing your vile body, instead of worshiping your vile body, the thing that God calls vile. See? The Bible says in one place, every man at his best state is altogether vanity. I'm not saying you can't go for a walk. I'm not saying you can't go for a run. I'm not saying you can't have fun going for a bike ride or a hike or playing basketball or anything like that. But your mind should understand and believe and your heart should be fixed on the fact that your body is vile and the only solution is that Jesus Christ is going to come back and change our vile body. Verse 21. In the moment, in the twinkling of an eye. Uh, 1 Corinthians 15. For, uh, 1 Thessalonians 4. Alright. Uh, follow Paul's example in those things. Follow Paul's example um, as he followed Christ. And, uh, alright, let's close in a word of prayer. We'll stop there and then uh, before, God help me, before we start chapter 8, we'll get into, next week we'll talk about the spirit and start talking about body, soul, spirit more uh, before we go on to chapter 8. Dear God, we thank you so much for many blessings. I thank you for this service. I thank you for the words of this book. I pray that you help us as we uh, strive to have victory over our flesh. Um, that we would serve the law of our mind, that we would delight in, in the law of God after the inward man, that we would love the words of your book, that we would cherish them, that we would follow after them, and that we would be the Christians that you'd have us to be, Lord. Not covetous, uh, not seeking after money, and not supposing that gain is godliness, um, but serving and following you, Lord. Uh, like the mighty men of old, like David, um, like Gideon and his 300, like Paul. Help us to be uh, what is described in these words, as we know that we can be in Christ. So in Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen.